Um, does anybody know what bird that is? Mm-hmm. I know you know, Michelle. Don't. <laughs> Guy in the back. Is it a cardinal? No. It's an elipio. It's a little. It should be a little bit fatter. It's a little browner. But there are three different types of elipios. One on Oahu, one on Hawaii, and one on the Big Island. Um, so I got introduced to this little guy um, when I was asked by Laura Margulies, who is also another talented artist here on Oahu, um, to make an animation. So she approached me, asked me if I wanted to do an animation. I said, are you sure? I've never made an animation in my life, let alone I'm pretty computer illiterate. So she started telling me about this project called the Symphony of Hawaiian Birds, and which is an educational program that brings awareness to grade school children about the decline in the populations of native Hawaiian forest birds, as well as their endangerment. So I said yes, because I believed in the, in the mission of the program. So what they do is they go into school systems and teach the children about the native Hawaiian birds. Then they come to the Blaisdell Concert Hall for a field trip. And on that field trip, they see five animations. And each animation, the music is speci um, specifically composed for the animation. And the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra plays it live. So for many of these students, they do not know about the birds, but they also have never seen the symphony live. Um, so we currently have shown this animation to about 8,000 kids so far. And it's continually going to be going. So I'm going to show that animation for you guys tonight. And it has a little pinker tint, which is okay, but it's, yeah, sorry about that. it's okay. No worries.
when I researched on what makes a good presentation, there's a thing called 10, 20, 30. 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point. So that's about 2,525 slides. <laughs> so I think I'm like way over. So if I go over a little bit, it's not a problem now. Um, so this process, it was very new to me. And it was a chance for me to work outside of my comfort zone. Um, I'm normally just myself in the studio, day in, day out. There's an opportunity to work with other artists um, and collaborate. So I went over to Laura's house. She has a stop motion animation set up. And I hired a other animator to actually help me with the more technical um, things because I could not learn how to program and do this animation in five months. So what my sort of um, responsibilities and strengths were was making all the cut paper and paintings of the birds and the bugs and the, um, the backgrounds. Um, so this is an example of the cut paper and the computer um, what, that was recording it. Um, so for this project, I started to work with the Bishop Museum Collections Department in the vertebrae department as well as the herbarium. So Molly Hadman and Barbara Kennedy were um, two women that helped me a lot with giving me um, species to draw as well as paint. Um, so there's a learning curve that I had with this project, and the biggest learning curve in the beginning was I made all my backgrounds vertical. And I did not realize that you have to make them horizontal for the way that it is shot. So with that, um, it's a happy accident because we decided to then create these large square backgrounds to go underneath the vertical, um, which actually worked in our benefit because then we could have things coming in from all sides. Um, so we just went with it because time was kind of very strange. So this is the young EEV. I focused on the EEV as well as the Elopayo. The young EEV um, is actually golden yellow. Um, so this was an opportunity for me to use glitter paper. If anybody has ever seen that before, it's fantastic. <laughs> so I had to use it. Um, so that's a little um, idea of what they are, what they look like before they are shot. Um, so since I had to depict um, these birds when they were thriving, as well as this, um, the plants and the insects that they ate, I had to think about what was available in the 1300s. Um, so I studied also with the entomology department, um, and as well as a Hawaiian um, specialist um, for this project. So it leads me to talk to you about how the work next door was created. Um, I enjoyed learning. I enjoyed learning about new species, um, new plants, um, specifically um, to endemic and native plants to Hawaii. Um, so this little guy, does anybody know what his name is or her? So it's, um, I believe it's part of the sunflower family, but it's called Nehe. Um, and the idea of tiny little plants or seeds or pods is an opportunity for me to notice, to pause, um, to really be still. So even though my work is very complex um, and maybe sometimes busy, um, the idea of, in the process of drawing and painting is much more of a meditative process for me. Um, so this idea of what do we focus on, um, how do we stay present, and what are those um, tools that we can use. So this, I don't, I guess, you kind of all see it. Um, so this is um, the painting that came from that little Nehe flower. 
Um, it's 15 by 15. Um, and the Bishop Museum Collections series is 15 total paintings, nine which are next door, and then six of which are at the Halalea Gallery on Hawaii. Um, and for this project, I study um, native algae, endemic algae, as well as native and endemic plants. And then I threw in invertebrates just for fun. So, <laughs> yeah, might as well. Okay. So, 95% um, of algae is microscopic, 12% is endemic to Hawaii. Um, so this is a little um, drawing that I did when I was working with the algae department and the Bishop Museum. Um, so I'm going to, for the next few slides, I'm going to show you what was inspired and then the work that was created from that. Um, one big thing, and I don't know if I stressed this before, is that saying yes to the animation project, I think opened up a whole idea of, the whole window of learning and uh, my interest in learning about these things. I do not, I'm not a professional, I'm not, um, do not know every fact, I probably don't know how to pronounce half the things. But just seeing new forms and new shapes um, really inspired me in this, in this body of work. So normally, um, I draw right onto my paintings. I don't really use sketchbooks. I have them, I guess, when I travel. I usually forget about them. Um, but I draw right onto the, onto the paintings. And for me, that's a way of just staying, um, staying fresh and staying present with my work and, it, and approaching my work new every single time. Um, I actually don't even try to erase a lot. Um, erasing damages the paper, but also um, erasing um, just doesn't make it as immediate as I want it to be. Um, so this piece, um, which is next door, um, is um, a triptych. So each one is 25 by 25, 25 by 75 long, um, which is called green, brown, red, um, which relates to the folders that Roy Suda gave me, which are labeled green, brown, and red. So he gave me these folders when I went to go meet him, and each one contained endemic algae to Hawaii. And I just loved the idea of these little folders containing all these specimens. So that is what came about from those three folders. Um, so seeing all this dead algae, I decided I should probably go see some live other than just what I eat at the sushi place. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was reading the Hana Ho magazine coming back from Hawaii, and what stuck out to me was this um, group called the Waimanalo Vinuhui. And they're located in Waimanalo, and they're an organization um, that is trying to restore the Inu population back to Waimanalo area. Um, and their idea is to go back to the source. So the source of life um, and replenishing the ocean goes back to the basics, and that is Limu. So Limu is one of the leading contributors to oxygen as well as food for the ocean. And what they do is, well you can actually too, is you volunteer and you make these Limu lays. So you make Limu lays out of raffia, and you braid into the raffia limu, and then you tie them around rocks, and they dive down into the ocean floor, and they, the, what the process is is that the little spores from the limu will come off and reproduce. Um, they actually have seen a huge difference um, in the ocean floors already. The fish are coming back, the corals coming back, it's healthier environment for all these organisms. Um, so from that came the piece, Lee um, 25 by 25, um, that's also next door. Um, and volunteering with them went beyond just being able to touch the Limu. I could probably do that 
somewhere else. Um, but they were very welcoming to me as an individual. Um, and this, their whole mission um, really strikes me and their sense of community. Um, I really respect that. So um, these are a little um, collection of the invertebrates that I worked with Holly Bollock from the Bishop Museum. Um, and this is Anthomascus on the left, and then the banded urchin and Aristotle's lantern, which is the center. Um, and for me, the Anthomastis, what I was interested in is actually those tiny little um, circles with the little dots. Um, I found that pattern much more interesting than anything. Um, but what I really appreciate about the Bishop Museum is that I had millions and millions of questions. I would ask them, what is this? I'd go on a walk or hike, what is that? Take photos, and they would come back with the Latin name, pictures, um, videos of them live. Um, they were a great resource, but extremely generous. And I really appreciate their enthusiasm and also taking me on as um, you know, someone who knew nothing. Um, so I actually even asked them tonight, I asked Barbara um, before I came here if my dress was invasive. Um, because it's a bird of paradise. And she did say it was non-native, non-invasive. So I was like, all right, I can do that. That's OK. Um, so inspiration comes from a lot of places. Um, I might be out to dinner, and I like a leaf that's on my salad. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to put that in my wallet and bring it home to draw. <laughs> Seriously, you can ask Mark, yes. Um, I often um, will find inspiration in very different places, but um, this is a Honolulu company called Kupu Place Aquaponics, um, and they're a great um, little company that um, grow microgreens. And this process also, um, this photo shows me drawing these microgreens onto my painting, but also um, a little side note, all those drawings were done with my opposite hand. So being in studio um, eight hours a day, six days a week, you kind of have to get creative sometimes. So I'll draw with my left hand. I will like draw with my contacts out or, you know, some things just to kind of remove myself from maybe my um, thinking mind completely. Um, and then these the blue stains that are on the left um, are from the butterfly um, pea stains. Um, I actually, my massage therapist gave me flowers, and I use them in a painting just to stain the painting. So you just rub them onto the paper, which is amazing. So that came to this piece. Um, this piece is not next door. Um, this is part of the collection, but this piece is called Nature Rarely Uses Yellow. It's 45 by 36. Um, and the title comes from an Emily Dickinson poem. Um, and again, little practices. I started to um, incorporate more reading into my studio practice um, and my day. I always kept reading to more of an evening kind of thing, but I felt like I needed to bring that back into my studio practice, so I'll take some reading breaks. Um, so that's where this title came from, but those items were what inspired it. Um, these are a few things from um, the algae and the herbarium department. You have Lobella, which is endemic, um, Cynthia Frisata, which is red algae endemic, and then the last one, I will not say the Latin, the Latin name, but it's the mintless mint, which is indigenous to Hawaii. Um, it gets kind of confusing for me um, learning all this. You learn about the endemic, indigenous, non-native, non native, the naturalized, invasive. Because the naturalized, I guess, is the new word for invasive. So it's, it's, it gets all kind of tricky, but I just I go for more for the Im images and the patterns. Um, this is a Chinese lantern hibiscus. And you can see I was more interested in the, the um, what was the stamen? The stamen, yes. 
the hangy bangy bit. What? The hangy bangy bit. They have, bit. yes, the thing that hangs out yeah. more than the petals. <laughs> um, and this was a funny thing where we all went hiking. Um, a couple of friends of ours, we went hiking, and everybody was looking at the hangy down, down thing, and we loved the shape of it. And everyone said, is that a hibiscus? Is that a hibiscus? We're not sure. And so of course I asked Barbara. She said yes. So we were correct. Um, but so what came from that is this piece, is that hibiscus. Um, that is 45 by 36. Um, and I found it interesting, the parallel between ocean matter and land matter. Um, some of them have some of the same shapes and patterns. Um, and you can't tell what's above ground or below ground. Um, and so this plant is this sort of blurred, but does anybody know what plant that is? Okay, it's called Ku, K-O-U, plant. Um, I am pleased to announce that that was actually outside of Waikiki growing, which is nice to see. Um, it is an indigenous plant. And from, I was showing my grandmother, who um, lives here in Hawaii, she, he's a, she's also an artist. The state owns her work, which is fabulous, but she is also an avid gardener. And so when I showed her that plant, she immediately wanted me to go back to the plant and get the seeds so that she could plant them in her own garden. So this piece is called Save Me the Seeds. It's 45 by 36, and this is not next door. This is um, in Kauai. So you might be wondering what's next for me. Yes. So what's next is that I was asked um, to be the fourth artist at the Molokai um, Artist Center Residency Program. So I'm going to be going there in May, and I'm going to be working with the Mokio Preserve, um, studying endemic plants, um, and going to Kalapapa, and working with the scientists there um, with also native um, and endemic plants, and then working with the organic and medicinal farms on the island. And actually, I think they have about eight organic farms. Um, so I'm going to be doing that for about three weeks plus. And um, mahalo for your time. Um, if you are interested in anything that I mentioned, um, my work can be seen at the Halalei Gallery on Kauai. Um, and if you want more information about the organizations, the Bishop Museum, Symphony of Hawaiian Birds, uh, we have another Symphony of Hawaiian Birds artist here, Lori. She's a fabulous animator, and she did one of the five animations. And um, those five animations actually will be aired at the Doris Duke um, May 17th to the 19th at their cultural film festival. Um, and then if you're interested in volunteering at the Waimon Nalo Limupui, they do things once a month. Um, and the Molokai Arts Center always, it's a nice to give them a shout out. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we'd like to have a brief Q&A, so if we can have you show here too. And if you have any questions for either of these two, raise your hand. You've got to have questions. You must have woken up in the morning to an elapio sometime, because I have. Do you have a question? No, we have a question right here. So, Jamie, you said you were going to be doing the uh, artist residency at Kalapapa, but will you be hiking down there each day? So the question <laughs> is, how is she going to get to Kalapapa when she's yeah. on Molokai? Are you going to ride the donkey or a boat <laughs> or walk? Well, we just went to Molokai, and actually the bridge is broke, right? <laughs> so the bridge is broken, so you have to actually fly there. Um, so I'm only going to go for one evening, because um, my most of my time is on the Mokio Preserve. Um, they just added that in for fun, I guess. So, thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about the Mokio Preserve? Is that the... 
natural natural area reserve on the top? Um, yes. Yes. It's like if you've ever been seen Star Wars where Luke Skywalker is spending his time in purgatory in the swamp. I think that's close to it. Well, I have never been actually. So when we did go visit, you have to have um, permission to go. And so I'm going to be working with a man named Butch. And they just planted all different um, endemic species there. So I'm going to be drawing there. Um, I do not know exactly what it's like, but I actually, I prefer not to know. So I'm going to be open to what it will present to me. Um, but I do, I did hear it was very hot. That it's, I need a good hat and sunscreen. So, sorry. Questions? Michelle. I wonder about your, that photo inspiration and how you translated that into your work. Does that edge, uh, that white edge, represent any type of coral bleaching event that that species is, is enduring, or is that its natural form? No, that's so the question is, we have to repeat the question okay. so everyone hears okay. it, your inspiration on your coral and the white edge. Mm -hmm. um, shelf coral does naturally have those white edges, which is wonderful. However, I did explore coral bleaching, and I made a couple of pieces, um, sort of statement pieces to that effect. Um, but no, that shelf coral, that is, it, that is a photo that it has not been bleached, so that's how it naturally occurs. So that's why I'm celebrating it, yeah. How did the, the concept of bleaching then manifest in your work, in those other pieces? Oh, just by reading about it and seeing the devastation. And this piece was devoid of color. Um, and it was sad. Um, and that was the point I was trying to make. But yeah. Thank you. A technical question. When I first saw your pieces, they looked like leather. They don't look clay. And is that porcelain? It is. And then you, you have to, to get that fine white line around it, that's a technique. So it's a technical question about the material. Tell us about how you get that. Okay. Um, I get that a lot. People are surprised that it's clay. Um, I use a porcelain blend. Uh, porcelain usually has to be fired to a very high temperature. Um, and because we have, you know, I, you know, I want to conserve energy. We have the highest cost in the nation. And I do run electric kilns. I found a cone five porcelain stoneware blend. So it's not pure uh, porcelain. Um, and also the glaze I use is a matte glaze. Um, so it has less silica in it. So it's not, it's not, um, and it also has some texture to it. So that's why it, it doesn't feel like clay. It feels, yeah. Not at all. Yeah. It, it, that's not a Majolica. No, no, no. And Majolica is very fussy. It, you know, it has to be the right viscosity. It looks so perfect, like it was sprayed on. I mean, I, I do. I spray my glazes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I because that. I want that. I mean, you know, there's some techniques where you want to see the hands, and you want to see. There's a lot of you know techniques like that. I want it to just sort of appear, and so I spray the glazes on. So there's no brush strokes or anything. I, in the in the beginning, I used brushes, but I didn't like that. I want it to just be clean. Um, Thank you. More questions? So the question then is you're rendering plants, not scientifically, but through the other side of your brain. Tell us about that. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm not a scientist. I'm an artist. So I think it frees me up from being completely accurate 
more meticulous with the renderings. I can be a little bit more playful. I can um, I, I can interpret them a little bit differently. I can make things purple where they're normally white. You know, so I and I don't see my work as um, just plant-based or um, about one specific plant. They're more diaristic. So I feel like I build these environments, a collection of what is going on in my life at the time. Um, and so this collection, though, uh, was interesting because I hadn't really ever done anything like that where I specifically went to a location and, and um, studied all different organisms. Um, but then again, um, other aspects of my personal life come into them. So the piece like what we tend to, which is the one with the, um, the pool cala, the big uh, poppies. Um, you know, the, it's, it's all about what do we tend to in our lives? Like do we um, tend to the negativity? Do we tend to aggression? Do we tend to peace? Do we tend to um, being mindful? Do we tend to um, being present? So um, that all came about when I was listening to podcasts uh, about this meditation teacher, Tara Brock, which I'm sure a lot of people know, but um, this idea of like, what do we tend to, what do we cultivate, and, um, and for me, um, that's what the piece comes about. It doesn't have to deal with like, okay, well then that's, what's this animal, what's that vertebrae, what's that invertebrae. Um, but really just a collection in of um, organisms that all live together. Um, so it's a good question, um, but I never see myself as a scientific, um, or um, I see a lot of those illustrate, like the hyper-realism illustrations of botanical, botanical illustrations, which are great, I admire them, but it's, I'm not interested in that. Um, I'm, and I also feel like, um, I'm much more interested in what the paint is doing, and what the paint and the drawing is doing, and what the process is. Um, so I hope that kind of answers, but a little vague, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was great. Yeah. More questions? Yes, yeah. um, In your piece of the homage to shelf coral, it, you know, the, the holes in the way things occur, allows the spotlights to cast a lot of shadows. And so there are some gradations of things that were covered up by all those spots. And it was serendipitous to see, and I wonder if you would recommend to people display them. So, lighting. so the question is, shadows play a big part of the way that you fabricate your work. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I actually trip on them a lot. <laughs> Um, part of my pieces and, and the concept sort of is that vessel form and sort of um, a voyeuristic approach to looking at nature and looking in and looking further and going inside and seeing what's in the center. Um, and so to have those holes that are kind of peekaboo spots and then the light shines depending on where you move the piece and how it's lit. I mean, sometimes I'll see my piece somewhere and I'm like, no. <laughs> That's not what I wanted, but I have to let that go. Um, but I do move my piece around. It's tricky because clay moves and things shrink and, you know, there is sometimes an intention to have specific spots in places and I can't always do it but you can certainly move the piece around with light, and I really enjoy doing that. Um, and I just want to say, the holes that I put in my pieces, I don't know when that started. It was something as simple as I rolled out a slab, I cut the shape, and I took a cutter, and I just put a hole in it. I felt compelled to do it. And I was like, okay, I don't know why. And I kept going with it, and over time, I just kept going with it. And so it really speaks to listening to yourself, but then letting go. And just you know having ideas in your head of what you want to make, but then letting, just letting go with it. And if you have a feeling about something, just do it. 
And don't be worried why you're doing it. And sometimes it's really stupid and you're never going to tell anybody that you did that. But a lot of times you do it and it's compelled and it's a true feeling. You know when it's true and you do it and you go, okay. And, and so that's where that evolved. Is that too long of an answer? <laughs> Thank you. That's great. And last couple questions. Um, Jeannie, I looked at your piece. <clears throat> Has anybody approached you to do augmented reality with some of your work? Putting the glasses on and having the birds just fly out. And I saw this display um, in Menlo Park, and it's by Japanese artists, where a mural like that just really comes alive. And electronically, everything is moving. Have you, have you seen that? I don't remember. I don't remember exactly. So the question is, as you explore into technology and animation, have you looked at even further augmented reality? Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, no. I can put you a <laughs> Would you be interested? I'm not sure. I, I don't identify with being an animator or dealing with work. Well, but I would be open. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I would have to explore that. <laughs> um, so yeah, with a lot of the technical stuff um, for my animation, that was all done by um, another woman um, because I did not really understand the, the programs. I was more the hands-on. I've always been more hands-on. But it would be interesting to collaborate with somebody and do that. I think that's probably how it would happen. Thank you. <laughs> and last question. Or was that the last one? Oh, we have one in the back. No? Can you raise your hand if you have a question? Oh, no. No, 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 no. no. Okay. Uh, the appropriate one to go out on. It's, uh, have you ever considered uh, doing your interpretation of a toilet? <laughs> okay, so yeah. porcelain it's brings to mind lots of things. And for this gentleman here, his question is Have you thought about interpreting porcelain? I'm so happy you got the humor of my slide. I debated whether or not to put that in there, but I just had to. Um, I have not considered that, but it is a good point that it has a hole. <laughs> You know, Chris, you may have started something for me. I don't know. I have not, I've, I, you know, I appreciate ready mates in that whole time period. Um, you know, there's the urinal on the wall. There could be a toilet on Kauai. I don't know. I, I might explore that. <laughs> Thank you to both of you. And thank you too for inspiring us to go home and doing whatever we feel inspired to do. Yeah, thank you.